Chad. What's up, Val? Not much. Just vibing here on this holiday week. That is true. You're it is looking act- Thanksgiving in the face. <laughs> Did you hate that? No. Whoa. It's just that when you <laughs> like, when you whoa. did this, people didn't see this motion because the oh, camera yeah, 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 was on yeah. me. So now do it again. Licking Thanksgiving. Wait, come on. Do the solo. Oh, there we go. Thanksgiving. <laughs> I had to nail the All right, we'll shots. work on that. We'll okay, work on that. Great. Um, but yeah, here we are right before Thanksgiving. Yeah. We have an exciting episode. Well, we always have an exciting episode, but I did actually particularly really, really, really enjoy this one. No, this was a very special one. Uh, very worthy of the Thanksgiving billing. Mm. Uh, A-Track, someone I'm very thankful for because not only is he one of my favorite DJs of all time, but he did give me my first real music industry job back in 2017 when he and Nick Catchtubs mm-hmm. actually hired me to work at Fool's Gold as an a r So this was a very, very special thing. for that. For, yeah. <laughs> uh, A-Track, thank you for allowing me to move out of my parents' house. So. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you had said that to him in person. <laughs> I, you know, Val, I tried to keep it professional, a little buttoned up here. I wasn't trying to yeah. go into yeah, yeah. all the... Which know, is also the... why we have a special guest, if you're watching. This is um, Shabadoo. Yes, so for those not watching, about. we have a uh, a nice little rubber duck here. Yeah. Named Shabadoo. Actually, this one right. is a first edition. It says I know. On the I saw that. From... For any duck sauce fans, you'll know you'll know him as the mascot of duck sauce. But he he joined us here today because obviously it was a fitting fitting moment for him to appear. Yes, and we talked a lot about Fool's Gold, which is celebrating its fifteenth anniversary this year. Mm-hmm. Um, they've been doing a lot of really cool things. You know, as a label, Fool's Gold has been culturally so important in this intersection between electronic music and hip hop. And yeah. all of the events that they've done over the years, Fool's Gold Day Off and um, all the different like sort of club tours and things that Fool's Gold has meant for cities across the United States. So now in its 15th year, they've been doing stuff in New York. Mm-hmm. They just wrapped up a cool residency where they had DJs like Mark Ronson and DJ Shadow pop in. They did a cool thing at Webster Hall. But now they're going to be doing something in L.A. Yeah. Very soon, December 1st, yes, is that right? Next yes, next Friday. At the Bellwether. Uh, so that's coming up soon, and it was great. It was really cool to, I mean, there's, like, so many things to talk to A-Track about because you can watch and, you know, consume any sort of, like, episode about his life and, like, early history as, like, an iconic DJ and, like, young, wonder kind kind of DJ. But it's really great to just talk to him about not only Fool's Gold and like that history and the milestone they're hitting this year, but also just about like what's going on today, which it was really exciting to talk to him about and like some of the interesting trends and like the waves of things, especially coming from someone who really lived through the history of not only dance music, but just music history and culture history for so long. So it was super interesting to talk to him about like viral trends, like having the first viral video from dance music that was the thing we talked about with him yeah the evolution of shows and like all this really interesting stuff there was a lot of echoes from some of the conversations we had recently yes yeah he mentioned he did mention the death of the monoculture and which is affirming feels like we're right on the pulse of what is interesting right now right yes yes right there for us and uh, (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah no there's just like a lot of there's a lot of stuff that i think is is kind of happening right now and it was great to get his uh take on it we also um, talk for a lengthy time about bagels and food yes which personally i loved so bear with us yes. you know the beginning of the episode we we spend a long time talking about that but i promise it's really interesting well val <laughs> food is not it should not be you know any we talked about fast food a lot the last episode That's because true. you know it's a passion of mine but a track himself <laughs> I mentioned he had a EP called the Tuna Melt EP, you yeah. know. So and um, but food, we can all agree on food, all right. Yes. So yes, that's one thing that we always know. Hot this podcast is failing. We go back to the food, You'll brownies catch us. and lemonade. It's all in the name. All this food. <laughs> <laughs> we'll become all this food if we have uh, to. And, but right now, this is all this noise. Yes. Okay. It won't be all this food yet. Not yet. But maybe after Thanksgiving, coming out of a food coma, we'll have a change of heart. <laughs> Um, but I can't wait for some actual pumpkin pie. I know. And turkey time when it's acceptable now, Val. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yes. have a we have a fun blooper you'll probably see also if you follow us. But Absolutely. um but yeah, enjoy this episode with A Track. It's a really good one. And we'll see we'll see you. No, no, we'll not see you next time. No, we'll see you next we'll time. We'll see you next time. Enjoy. All right.
hot topic Uh-oh. to start. <laughs> Get us started. I'm really excited to talk to you about this because I have a passion for Montreal bagels. Okay, we'll talk about it. And I'm a deeply, a deep fan of St. Viator bagels. Yeah. Oh, okay. no. Are we taping it? Yeah, we're taping. Okay, okay. Oh, no, you don't agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're good. But, okay. No, your voice went so hot. You're like, yeah, yeah, they're good. <laughs> they are. Okay. No, here's the thing. Okay. Montreal bagels are delicious. I'm thrilled to know that, you, that you've that you tasted them and that you like them. <laughs> yes. um, they are definitely better than... New York bagels and other bagels. Okay. And I'm glad you New agree. Because oh, I agree okay. with that. And I wasn't I was, expecting that. I was going to say, okay, you're sure. like a specific person to talk to about this because you're Jewish and you've lived in New York, in basically. In both Montreal so. and New York. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah. Montreal bagels are are they're just so light and refreshing and delicious. And like they're crispy great. on the yeah. outside. Which so I good. grew up like literally walking distance. There's like two bagel shops oh, I know. that people know about. Yes. Vieta and Fairmount. And the street that I lived on, I lived between St. Vieta and Fairmount. So I'm like, it's like an isosceles triangle. Like I'm equidistant <laughs> from either bagel the shop. The Bermuda Triangle of bagels. <laughs> yeah. I was equidistant from both. They're literally a block away. Objectively, they taste the same. It's the same bagel. There's two okay. shops that are the official Montreal bagel shops. And, it, and, and it's all about that. The way that like my my parents, my dad in particular, my dad's like attitude with like local businesses and shops, it's always to like support the underdog and support the smaller businesses. Fairmount is kind of the underdog, so we we always oh. have Fairmount bagels in my household. Okay, it's only for uh, maybe uh, political, like yeah, just support the underdog <laughs> kind of vibe. But they're Saint basically the is, same, is what you're yes. saying. Yes, and so in the big picture, Saint-Vietar is delicious. I'm really happy that we're starting on this note of like pro same, Montreal same. and so I applaud your good taste uh, that's good but my little yeah was just because there's the other guys like history. even a little more sort of like hey what about us okay well, th- that's, that's interesting. a fair reason I was not expecting you to say it was better than New York bagels though because like oh, that sure. is that's okay. the thing no I mean New York bagels are good if you want to take a nap like <laughs> they're <laughs> yeah. good if you want to just sort of like a calorie bomb at 7am yeah but Montreal uh, bagels are better than New York bagels and now, when I say that to people they're like the whoa o- yeah the only way out of that argument is to say <laughs> well they're not actually the same thing Right. Like, like that's the, yeah, sure. the only way out is to be like, well, New York bagels are a lot, I don't know, they're just like bigger, like there's barely a hole in them. They're just like these mm. big like feeling. Fluffy. Yeah. And Montreal yeah. bagels are all like light with sesame and like, yes. you so know. good. Yeah. 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 So, so if you say that it's like apples and oranges, right. That's the only argument I'll accept other than Montreal bagels are better because Montreal bagels are better. Okay, well, then this leads me to my next question. So I have to ask this while we're on the yeah. food topic. So obviously, you've been an LA resident for a minute, yeah, and, New York, yeah. and New York, and New York, and yeah, yeah, and um, you know, there's a a lot of New York transplants here that kind of trash the pizza and bagel game out here. Now, a lot of the Ooh. things about why people say it's better in New York is the theory is because of the water. Mm-hmm. I've heard. Is that. that something that you agree or disagree with? I've never even had pizza in LA. Oh, I seen didn't, that. I didn't know there was pizza in LA. <laughs> that says it all. Okay, weird. <laughs> Why? Well, you know, pizza it's so. LA? I've never seen pizza in LA. Yeah, Is there yeah. pizza in LA? <laughs> no, but like, I also wouldn't have Mexican food in New York. I've tried, and right. it's just that's like, true. Right. Each, yeah. Certain cities have their specialty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, New York pizza is very special for sure. Yeah. Um, very cheap. Hmm? <laughs> and very cheap. It's cheap for <laughs> yeah. sure. Well, we do have like a we have like a Joe's out here, but. People were saying, like, it's just not the same Joe's as yeah. in, like, New York where you walk in. I believe it. You know? Yeah, I believe, I believe it. That. I, think, I think the water is different. Um, similarly with bagels, like, what are you going to have, like, Einstein bagels? Or, like, <laughs> Western. Okay. No, it's so, not that bad. Yeah. They're okay. Like, I, I don't know. I go to a certain, I'll walk by a bagel shop, like, at the airport or, like, I don't know. Whatever. Okay, the airport bagel shop is not an LA bagel shop. I mean, <laughs> or just whatever. I'm just trying to think of an. The, the, the other thing that's yeah, funny yeah. with LA like neighborhoods is like people will be like, oh, but you know, if you complain about like LA being like a car city where you can't yeah. just like walk to the coffee shop or this or that, they'll right. be like, oh, well, what about Venice or what about Larchmont or what about Los Feliz? And any of those areas they're describing like, or like Franklin Village, it's like two blocks. Okay. <laughs> where, you, yeah. where there's the a walkable, couple of restaurants and a little th- same thing with Larchmont. Totally. And then you're like, I'm like, this is your fucking neighborhood that we're talking about. <laughs> this is t- two blocks, and then it's, it's on all to we have. Else. Okay. Uh, no. Well, you I know, don't know. I'm I'm just 
I was raised on um, Montreal bagels and then I go like this can even goes into like a Canada versus US thing. I'll see like American bagels and I'll be like, what the hell is like, what's Asiago? Like, I don't even, I, I, I don't think that exists. <laughs> Outside of a breaded product. Outside, yeah, exactly. I think yeah. it's a made up word. Yeah, that's right. I think it's a psyop. Yeah, well, it is a psyop. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but you know, t I gotta, I, as an LA resident, I gotta, I gotta say like our donut game is pretty solid. So, yeah. yeah. Well, the, in that documentary, uh, what's it called? Donut, Donut King. King. Donut King. Yes. Yeah. That yeah. was. I mean, I, I like how that doc was like a, sort of a Trojan oh, my horse. Is in that doc. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I like how it's a Trojan horse of like, we're gonna talk about donuts, but really we're talking about immigration. Yeah. Yeah. Immigration and quotas. Name style. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I think to what what you were saying, there's certain, you know, pockets of uh, immigrants that came to different regions, and then they brought their specialty. You know? Yeah. Like and Vietnamese quotas food. from specific countries, like oh we. Like I forget when in the '60s or something was like oh let's let more Cambodians in and like totally and how that led to to certain types of donut shops or restaurants yeah or mm -hmm. and yeah, I think that, that speaks yeah to like the Vietnamese population in SoCal like there's a certain you know we have our specialties and stuff uh, in that regard and the donut yeah. culture is, is an extension of that but that's cool I mean going back to the Montreal culture we want to yeah. talk about music yeah because yeah. obviously that's what this podcast is about it it could be food related <laughs> I, mean about I, food. <laughs> I know i feel like no, you're a big foodie aren't you so like i don't yeah i guess the word foodie <laughs> confuses me because i'm like as opposed to what like there's people who don't like food like there <laughs> are yeah i don't acknowledge okay because like, my my whole thing this is like a personal thing i hate eating on the go right because yeah. i feel like it's a waste of a meal because you don't get to enjoy your food. Like, yeah. to actually sit down and just, like, taste it. This is, like, a very big personal thing that I have. Yeah, so, yeah, I yeah. consider myself a foodie in that It doesn't way. taste as good as if you're mobile. And there's people who just eat for sustenance. Yeah, right. we're definitely living in weird, like, NPC times. Oh, of, I, like, I totally agree. The efficiency, yes. the sweet green efficiency meal. Yeah. Like, must eat while I am productive. And yeah. I, eat, I eat sweet green. I eat all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dig yeah. in, whatever else. But it, it does feel like we're in a video game. Like, totally. Must still send email. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Well, the, I, I agree with that because I do, I do see sweet green providing a certain value. But then I have to, like, counterbalance it with a diner, you know? Yeah. But you can't have you, the diner. I love diners. I went, literally went to a diner yesterday, you know? <laughs> and I was just cool. like. You know, I like cool. the big menu that has like way too much stuff. And, well, you know, there's only two or three things on that huge menu that's actually good. Like, <laughs> and this is ties into music because you had an EP called the Tuna Melt EP. I did. <laughs> I Great did. tie in. Yeah. I love that. Hey, you know, yeah, I, I know the man's good. body of work. That was good. Um, but yeah, so but I, we didn't talk about why donuts and bagels are the same shape, but they're like, are they cousins? Well, see that that's interesting. Yeah. Do you think they're cousins? I yeah. think they're cousins. I think they're cousins. For sure. Yeah, you could say like a a bagel is maybe like a stale donut in a way, or like a more evolved a stale donut. Like, <laughs> like not a stale, but <laughs> whoa, like it's, whoa, whoa. and then like our pretzels like the further in the family tree. Right. Oh, I always pretzels, thought it was interesting yeah. how like <laughs> big pretzels and small pretzels are kind of different food. Like the small ones are like the really dry ones, and yes. the big pretzel is like. Right. There's Zoe. a whole pretzel. There's a okay. there's a whole pretzel. I got something for this though. Because you can say that you can <laughs> like one type of pretzel and yes. not like like I don't. I don't love small pretzels, but big pretz pretzels are good. I'm also <laughs> gluten free for a couple of years now, so I can't enjoy most of these. Yeah, or like, yeah. You know, limited quantities. You remember. you remember? I remember for sure. No, I got something on this. So you got your you got the tiny twists, and then you've got like the soft pretzel, right? So these are like two opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Right in the middle. The sourdough pretzel, like the hard pretzel that uh, comes in a barrel at Costco. Uh, this is my number one snack. You were also talking about this. Recently. I was, and yeah. I had like eight of them last night before I went to bed, which is probably not good. But you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah. but but that that is the healthy medium because I agree with you. It's like kind of like the in, like on either end, it's kind of like, mm, but yeah. like right there in that middle, yeah, is that sourdough barrel? <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, I don't know the the pretzel um, genus. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you could almost break it up into two. Right. I'm like, fuck the rest of the episode. Let's just this talk is, about food and pretzels on, and all but, the families of food. But, uh, but I did, while we're on the topic somewhat of, mm -hmm. of Montreal. Let's go back to Montreal. Uh, <laughs> okay. Because I've, I've heard, I, you would be obviously the expert uh, to weigh in on this, but I've heard nothing but great things about Montreal's music scene. Mm -hmm. uh, most so recently, good. we did a tour with um knock two who's yep. up and coming dj who's been you know doing and i was on the tour a lot of stops shout out to he, him shout out knock two mm -hmm. he said by far the best stop was montreal that's dope yeah and one of the best clubs i think in the world underrated mm -hmm. stereo stereo's mm -hmm. dope 100 percent. um and so why what is what is so special about montreal that gets overlooked by i think the wider public it's funny and like like everything uh 
like everything Canadian, like the more, <laughs> beneath the surface, it's a little, it's also a little more complicated than it seems uh-huh. in the sense that like shows in Montreal could be absolutely insane energy, like super nutty. Like what, you know, what is this place where people are, you know, in the hysterics also on certain tours, Montreal could be sometimes surprisingly challenging to like, just sort of like sell through because um, it's hard to get Montrealers to spend money. <laughs> Montreal's okay. a cheap city. Like, and I, I don't see this as a negative thing. It's an yeah. inexpensive city. Yeah. You know, it has that sort of Berlin-esque thing where like rent is super cheap. That's changing a bit now, but mm-hmm. still everything is pretty expensive. There's a lot of just sort of like artsy kids that roam around and squat around and, and go to after hour parties or and even clubs themselves are open a lot later than most cities in the states yeah so you get a very healthy um nightlife scene but you also get people who you know don't really feel like buying tickets for something three weeks ahead and like mm-hmm. your show ends up being really good but everybody buys their ticket the night the day before yeah. everybody's just kind of chilling in montreal i guess is what i'm saying <laughs> yeah yeah totally. <laughs> um but i think there's a few factors i mean first of all there's a lot of like even demographically, generationally, it's a city that has like many big universities. Mm-hmm. So you, so you, there's a lot of youth. Mm-hmm. There's just like a lot of young people who are mm-hmm. typically who you know the people that go out. There's definitely that cultural thing where Montreal gets you know as much of an influence from Europe as it does from North America. Like that thing that we all saw in North America, you know, with the EDM boom or whatever, where electronic music used to be quite niche in North America. That it wasn't like that when I grew up in Montreal, techno house drum and bass all the, that those scenes were big, you know, in ninety seven, ninety eight, whatever the years that I was getting into the DJ scene, you know, at a time period where it was like it had become quite niche in most American cities and it was sort of thriving in Europe. We had a lot of it in Montreal, even Toronto. I don't give Toronto much props for anything, but they had decent. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, well, it, it goes back to the you know he's got to support the local. Yeah. You know, well, hey, no, like, like every you know you got to understand. He's like, no, Toronto sucks. <laughs> yeah. When you grow up in Montreal, you hate Boston and and you make fun of Toronto. That's right. like that's what you grow up. Right. Those are the rules when you grow And the Boston thing is a hockey thing, and I don't even care about sports, but, sure, like, sure. you're just bred. Canadian to, within. Yeah, just, yeah. like, yeah. every year you hear everyone around you just be like, Boston beat us in the playoffs. So you just, like... <laughs> And I've lived most of my life in Montreal and New York, two cities that hate Boston. Yeah. So, mm. and yet again, Duck Sauce, I'm with Armand who grew up in Boston. So, sure. you know, love wins. But um, <laughs> the <laughs> cultural <laughs> osmosis came yeah. in and gave him yeah, that yeah. anti I, 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 I deprogrammed my prejudice. Uh, there you go. Um, you, yeah, there's a lot of youth in Montreal. There's, we got a lot of music from kind of everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think it's like, there's something about Quebec as a province in Mo- Montreal, generally that like really celebrates multiculturalism and celebrates the arts and like um, arts and music created from, you know, the diverse people that make up Montreal. Those are things that are like put at the forefront mm-hmm. in Montreal more than a lot of other cities. Having grown up, grown up there, I think I took that for granted. Then I lived in other cities and I was like, Oh, Montreal is really special. Like if mm-hmm. I remember, you know, when I was like 16 or something playing at this like avant-garde electronic music festival that also had the, these like robotic arms that were trying to that were like scratching records and like <laughs> Amon Tobin and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, yeah. And you know, they would write about that in the in the newspapers and like they would talk about it on TV. Like those things were really showcased a lot yeah. culturally mm-hmm. whereas in America it's more like money, 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 business, business. like Th- those are the things that people hear about. And in Montreal, yeah. it was like, look at this, you know, artsy, uh, you know, African film festival that we're going to do every summer. And like, hey, everybody, let's go to the Middle Eastern market. And right. Like, you know, like, and that was more the mainline culture. Yeah. The, the, mm-hmm. Everything that makes, um, that makes up the, the diverse culture of Montreal would be put to the forefront a lot. And music was a part of that. The same way there's also a rich uh, restaurant culture mm-hmm. in montreal so um in great museums like to me that all goes hands in hand hand in hand with the way that culture is, is celebrated and and um yeah that demographic thing i was talking about where there's just like a lot of young people that yeah. need to go out clubs yeah. are open pretty like very late actually 
Um, I mean, it's still, I'll never get used to California stuff closing at two. Like, it just, I, I know. it doesn't it continue doesn't for me. Lame. I, I wonder if that will change, probably. Every year there's soon, there's it, some sort of conversation, like, oh, they're about to try to pass a law. I hope they do, but, like, it's just weird. I think money ultimately becomes the greatest decider for that. And, um, yeah. you know, we saw raves go away from L.A., mm -hmm. and now they're back in the middle of L.A. in very public areas. And I think that because they see this business opportunity, if they see... You know that, and you know going, but going back to Montreal. Also, I wanted to kind of comment that you had brought Fool's Gold Day off there. Yeah, um, I, I remember even more recently. I think it was like Jazz Cartier, I believe, was, mm -hmm. and there was this, there was this video of him, and he was on like a, a, a like a building. Yeah, it was sort of like yeah, climbing off of some sort of rafter thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he it just yeah, Montreal goes crazy. Just absolute pandemonium. Yeah, Montreal and... goes crazy because I yeah, went to yeah. Igloo Fest. Oh yeah, in the middle of winter, yeah. and everyone's outside partying, and you just get so drunk. And also wear your like seventies ski outfits. You wear your ski outfits. No, but people <laughs> yeah, need to understand that crazy. I I was wearing like ski pants when I was just walking to school every day. Like, right. Yeah. Like if it's okay now, I live. New York and LA, a little more New York. But let's say it's, there's a cold day and people will be, if I'm like, damn, it's cold today, people will be like, but you're Canadian. I'm like, I'm not, I don't have different <laughs> blood and skin cells than you. When I lived in Montreal and I was walking to school in the morning, I would wear like snow pants, ski pants over my pants. I had, you know, a beanie, whatever, down to here and a, a scarf up to here. The only thing that you could see was my eyes and my, uh, my eyelids would freeze together. <laughs> When I'd be walking to school in the morning, that's how cold it is. You just have was. different clothes and right. you get to school early enough right. to take off all your oh, winter clothes yeah. and stuff it in your locker before yeah. you have to get to class. So that's how cold it is. Yeah. And it's, yeah, I, I can still get, if I'm dressed like this and it's like 40 degrees, I will be cold. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, it hasn't, your your DNA hasn't changed as a yeah. result of, of that. But I... But it's curi I'm curious because, like, how does it feel for you to be able to, like, give back and, like, bring, you know, you're able to bring Fool's Gold Day off back to, to Montreal? Montreal. Yeah. And, like, do you think that in a way it was, like, you know, because I'm sure for a lot of people to put that on, like, part of your tour date or it makes sense for you as an individual, but, like, you're kind of, like, showcasing it all also in a yeah. way, right? But there's also been periods of my career where I'd be playing less shows in Montreal. Like, there's, for whatever reason... You know, there's certain cities that, like, if you're doing a tour, agents will often leave out certain cities yeah. because of, like, routing reasons. Like, if you're doing a routed tour, a lot of people don't stop in Miami because Miami's kind of out of the way compared to, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Montreal, I don't know why. Like, it, sometimes it's not part of these routed tours that we do on certain years. Um, there's also a bunch of years where I was just kind of, like, in the whirlwind of, like, building my profile in a bunch of other regions and i feel like every couple of years i have these little moments of awareness of like damn i need to make sure that like i'm still touching down you go home in montreal and like yeah. yeah and like including or like um connecting with whoever's like the younger scene there because also for every couple of years when the music scene changes sort of naturally in a city like montreal there's also a whole process of like you know teaming up with whoever's the promoters and venues yeah. doing shows similar to what I've built, you know, in, mm -hmm. in North America. Elsewhere. And there's always like a new youth cycle. In every yeah. city, I was going to say, what is the scene know? like there right now? Like um, who's, who's interesting out there? Well, you know, Fool's Gold has a uh, high classified, a really awesome uh, producer and DJ. Um, but you know, one thing I was going to mention, and it's kind of part of what I can answer here is like the other thing to keep in mind with the music scene in Montreal is um, like there's the language thing like ha especially when it comes to like I grew up in the hip hop scene mm -hmm. and there was French rappers and English rappers yeah you know and I was starting to DJ when I was a teenager and my brother Dave was like sort of transitioning from playing in bands to learning how to like use a sampler and make hip hop beats and as a you know he was a producer I was a DJ and we would work with certain local artists but we were in a position where we could work with French rap artists and English rap artists. Mm -hmm. And there was like two different parts of the scene where we didn't have to be constricted to just one part. But like that really is a big part of what makes the scene what it is. And even when you go into nightlife and electronic music, there's pockets that are more francophone, pockets that are more anglophone. I mean, in recent years, obviously, Keitra is from Montreal. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. his his whole movement, him and his brother, and the, you know, that scene's been uh, super important. Lunas is from Montreal. Yeah. Um, 
Well, that, that that I think Kate Trinata and Lunas are two really good examples of kind of another segue into kind of talking more about Fool's Gold as well. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah, but to answer your question, oh yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> please. So <laughs> I, uh, yeah, for like I left, I I left Montreal, moved to New York in two thousand six, mm-hmm. kind of ten years into my DJ career, um, and like I was like halfway through my stint of touring with Kanye and like. Within a few months, uh, linked up with, you know, Cash Dubs and and Dust La Rock and you know, my brother and I we uh, started Fool's Gold the four of us together. Um, so starting Fool's Gold kind of like planted new roots for me in New York, and from that point on, it was such like, and I was also like learning how to produce at that point in time, and and um, kind of putting a lot of pressure on myself and trying to figure out how to like use you know logic and ableton and pro tools and whatever else and just Mm -hmm. you know take on these remixes and just try my hand at like a whole new thing while djing while launching the label so everything was like kind of a tornado every day and and i was just trying to like launch this thing um and even starting to produce artists for the first time after just being like the scratch you know wonder kid or whatever for the early stage of my career so i was trying so many new things that like going back to Montreal, um, sometimes like a year or two would go back, you go by where you know it wouldn't even like occur to me to be like, oh shit, let's go do a show in Montreal. The same way that I'm building this new scene in New York, in Chicago, LA, San Francisco, Miami, all these little pockets, and then going to Europe doing tours with like Medi and some of those guys. Like there was such, there was, it was such a period of like active building. Um, I would have, I would sometimes have to remind myself to go back to the city that I'm from that has a really exciting scene too, and um, and um, yeah, and in in those early years of Fool's Gold, we were doing parties, um, that uh, between like uh, there was like a couple, a couple um, fuck, I'm blanking on the name of this crew. Um, but my my buddy D.L. Healy was like one of the main uh, promoters. Mm-hmm. We found like a, a crew that had like that was throwing parties that was in the same mindset as us. And um, also this company Neon that was like really active. That was sort of like related to Turbo Tiga's label. Okay. Um, but also related to like some of the label projects I was doing in Montreal with my first label audio research right before we left. It was like kind of designers in common, people that you know, worked on in those various companies. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we kind of connected with a few of those teams in Montreal once Fool's Gold was active and we started throwing parties there. Um, And then um, Fool's Gold Day Off was born a few years later. 2010 was the first Fool's Gold Day Off in New York. We we threw a block party, um, a free block party on the Monday of Labor Day weekend. So because it was on Labor Day, we called it Day Off. Mm. And um, yeah, we managed to make it a free party and, and um, you know, bring in a couple artists and, and, you know, combine rappers and DJs in a way that was kind of new at the time. And, you know, on year two, it was even higher profile. We brought in Juicy J, who was just starting his renaissance and just starting to put out solo mixtapes, you yep. know, after years of doing 3-6 Mafia. And you guys had collaborated on a song. Yeah, I think that might have been after, after booking the fact. him. But yeah, but you I'd were making you... these like you know these inroads. Obviously. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I just had my hands in connecting the electronic music scene and the hip hop scene that I was from, and mm-hmm. and the sound itself changing. And and day off grew pretty fast. Like right from the second year, we also did it in L.A. And then yep. over the following years, it became you know New York, L.A. Most year, certain years, Miami or. or Austin, Atlanta, Chicago, Toronto. Uh, we even did, we did Denver one year. On any given year, we would do like three or four cities. And um, after a couple of years, we were able to also bring that to Montreal. That was actually an interesting connection because my cousin Zach has a has a, a company brand uh, called Saint Woods that's based in Montreal, and they are sort of like half nightlife they they operate a uh, apartment 200 that now has a venue in LA too. Yeah. So sort of half nightlife brand half clothing brand slash agency um wow. the super dope and, I've, and you know my brother and i were sort of early investors in that company um but zach and his team are also super active and like to their credit they've built the, the whole thing um 
the parties that they were throwing in the events that the venues that they were you know involved with um even just as apartment 200 in montreal was hitting its stride originally you know probably 10 years ago at this point mm -hmm. it was there was um it was connecting with a lot of the similar collaborators to yeah. what we were doing mm -hmm. in um in new york and with fool's gold so we started doing fool's gold day off with them in montreal and they were connecting with this um outdoor festival called mural mural festival um which is like literally like a spot where there's murals <laughs> and um <laughs> yeah Makes and sense. yeah we started doing day off we did day off there with mural festival and saint woods probably like five or six years in a row for a while and th there was a good like growth period where like all of our crews and brands and you know uh audiences were growing kind of in parallel and we were yeah. able to like connect and sync up well for those who don't know about fool's gold day off uh a little bit more context like you know gold it did Aaron. really because you said it's block party i think is a great way to describe mm -hmm. it it did have a very community oriented but collaborative for sure spirit but you know you were also able to bridge the gap between you know the french djs guys who were more stateside like foster mm -hmm. and in the electronic american scene and then you know Fool's Gold Day Off 2015 in LA. We see Post Malone and Travis mm -hmm. Scott For sure. and Danny Brown and Jaden Smith is on stage with and there's DJs and, it's and we're bringing like, out Chief Keef and, and we're Chief bringing Keef. out Cameron and we're yeah we're, we're we're you know Big Sean. I mean a lot of people saw a lot of people first saw Travis Scott at our events for yeah. sure. Yeah, we played like at least three Fool's Gold Days off in between New York and LA. Um, but the electronic music component was right there also. Yeah, like it was in sort between of, sets. And, yeah, yeah. So you know. Fool's Gold is definitely a label that has, you know, as much a hip-hop branch as an electronic branch. Yeah. And Day Off, specifically as an event franchise, was always more on the rap side. Um, but like you said, in between, you know, ASAP Ferg and The Locks or whatever, <laughs> those are the artists that would play our shows, yeah. you would find um, What's So Not. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or, or you would find like Alice in Wonderland or, or you know, Hudson Mohawk or any of our friends in, but and, and it would be fun to see those DJs kind of like adapt their set a little bit to a crowd that leans kind of hip hop but was open minded too. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the first Bintrill uh, DJ sets uh, was, was that day off. Like there's just there's just a whole generation that you know would come to these shows every year, and I think you know uh, it it uh, catalyzed it helped grow yeah. like that 2010s. Um, era of music and culture like the asap guys would be at all our shows coming out doing surprise appearances and um and also the 2010s felt a little bit more intersectional in that way well it was, yeah because that intersectional know. thing was was kind of new yeah yeah you know yeah there was a return to an eclecticism that you know hadn't really been there in the music scene since like maybe the 80s like yeah. when you hear about the heyday of like the sort of um yeah the heyday of like you know art gallery era new york you know com fab five freddy and bambada mm -hmm. you know rubbing shoulders with like blondie and like you know basquiat and like yeah. 80s era warhol and and you know you got like run dmc performing at the roxy next to like a punk band or whatever like totally that those yeah. collisions that was always such a an, an inspiration Point for me yeah. as a DJ, I, I was always so enamored with, you know, or even just hearing about like late '80s LA, you know, Beastie Boys and Chili, Pe Chili Peppers at the Palladium co-headline, co-headline, yeah. like yeah. you know that that era where you had like <laughs> the early raves um, in LA and you know Beasties and Run DMC playing next to yeah. Punk bands. You have Bjork going out to the desert and going to these, you know, these raves. And, yeah. And, and like, yeah. I think we I saw. I think that, that kind of went away with the sort of VMA era of like mega stars in the 90s, mm. which I'm not knocking. That was amazing too. Um, but then once the mid 2000s came, came around and you had like the iPod and people were able to like make their own playlists and just put all their favorite songs in one place. Yeah. I think that really helped between mm. that and blogs. And, you know, LimeWire, Kazaa, Napster, people being like, let me, you know, let me download a bunch of songs that, uh, you know, I feel like listening to. And, and, put them all together. Yeah, put them all together. Well, like, oh, let me get like the best 
pure songs, but let me also get, you know, the Rapture's new album. And yeah. but let me also get like uh hyphy, some like some new hyphy <laughs> rap records. You yeah. know, that's what we were all doing on on yeah. you know. Yeah, and that coincides kind of with when the year Fool's Goal started, two thousand seven. Yeah. Now we're celebrating the fifteenth anniversary. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the things I I recently read uh, Lena Bascal's book Never yeah. Be Alone Again, which you wrote the foreword for. I did. Shout out to Lena, she and did a great job. Some might consider you a you know a godfather of this blog house era, um, but uh, one of the things that was kind of interesting is like you were mentioning. I think we saw the seeds of that happening. You're talking about that that intersection where it's like you had Kanye and Lupe Fiasco or Will mm-hmm. I Am and these guys coming to these Will clubs. I am, AKA Super Black. Super yes. Super Black. <laughs> <laughs> um there was actually that great protect and entertain song where Murs kind of yeah. catalogs the whole oh nightlife scene sure. in LA. The scene. and busy Shout p Murs, and man. yeah crookers Shout. and yeah. just all that i i remember um yeah but th- I, that was kind of like that th- you started to see that but then what fool's goal kind of took yeah it it was sort of like then a full a little bit more of a realized version of of i think where that was kind of headed um i appreciate that i mean i think you know, um, we started Fool's Gold at a point in time where it felt like everyone around us was making amazing music and art and just, like, inventing shit. Just, mm-hmm. m- you know, making shit that was just different and, and new and very spontaneous. And it felt like the bigger labels and, you know, anyone that was sort of, like, in a position of cutting a check or, or or whatever was not seeing what was going on on the ground and the bigger labels in fact were sort of panicking because of downloads and everything so so they you know they weren't seeing that like on the ground there was some cool new shit happening you know because i remember you know i was producing some of the early kid sister songs alongside triple exchange who also did the first spank rock album and yeah you know her brother josh uh yeah me too um we were all kind of like the creative team and and we were trying to see what label could put out that music and you know sort of uh cubicle america wasn't really getting it and there's a point where we're like let's just do this ourselves yeah you know and that that climate was was um kind of the pretext for starting starting fool's gold and you know nick Cash Dubs and I, you know, we kind of, we've always been sort of the face of the label. Shout out, Nick. Um, shout out to Nick, <laughs> of course. And um, he and I were just sort of becoming closer friends around that time, too. Uh, I had just met him a year or two prior. And we both, um, along with Dave, my brother, who's very visionary in a lot of projects I do, and along with Dust, Dust Rock, who could just, like, create this visual universe around anything, mm-hmm. All of us would have these conversations about like just how some of this new music and these parties and this culture needed to be crystallized and needed to be captured for the history books and presented to the rest of the world and even yeah. just sent to the rest of the world or, mm-hmm. you know, put online. You know, it was a point in time where everyone was in every city there started being that city's version of Cobra Snake. Mm-hmm. That was taking photos of the party that happened the night before. The historians. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and people in other cities would look at the photo galleries of uh, last night's party mm-hmm. or Nikki Digital or Cobra Snake or anyone like that driven by boredom um, and sort of daydream about a party like that in their city. And then some, you know, a few of those people would be like, well, let's just start it. And they yeah. would do it and get on MySpace and connect. And um, yeah, we just sort of felt this this need to to help capture these things that were happening and figure out the best way to present it to to the world, which includes artwork, which includes sometimes music videos or or, or collaborators remixes. Like, how do you take this thing that's already awesome and just add a little tweak and a little nudge and a little you know paint stroke of a paintbrush here and there, and then present it the same way that a lot of our favorite labels, you know captured these moments in history yeah you know throughout time and a lot of it was the art direction you know and mm-hmm. and dust yeah. the rock um rest in peace mm-hmm. you know like so much of it had this character <clears throat> and this texture that just kind of jumped out yeah at you. personality yeah for personality. sure for sure Dust was a huge part of what we built with fool's gold um and for those first five years he was the hand behind 
everything when we opened our first shop on Metropolitan in, in Williamsburg, the, the wallpaper was drawn by him. Like he did everything. Yeah. Duck sauce logos and the, the, the duck that we still have inflamed it, infl- uh, inflated. The duck right here. We yeah, that's yeah, the small. So yeah, that's <laughs> Shabadoo okay. is the name of the duck. Shabadoo. <laughs> yeah. Shabadoo. yeah. Shabadoo. It went. So there's a little, there's a funny story about the big Shabadoo that's on stage and then that guy. Yeah. So Doug, uh, duck sauce, sorry, Dust Laroc came up with a couple of like variations of the duck sauce logo. And one of them was this cartoon duck holding a record and it said duck sauce in sort of like action hero mm-hmm. lettering. And then one day Nick went to, I want to say a basketball game and they were like giving out these little duck toys that had. I forget which like basketball player's face. On. Oh yeah, and he's like, "Who makes these? Who makes these? like we're we you know we had just started Duck Sauce and Nick was part of the brain trust and he's he yep. finds out that there's a company called Celebra Ducks that makes these like Ducks. yeah that makes these ducks that had a couple of like you know athlete faces on them but really like you could hire Celebra Ducks to make a duck of whatever character you want so we're <laughs> like amazing. oh we need to make Duck Sauce toys so we sent this company Dust's logo the duck sauce logo that is you know a 2d yeah. duck and we're like can you guys make us a duck like this that's like, holding oh, a yes, record and that, yeah so they made that <laughs> can you put duck. him in the middle I yeah we'll put it right here so they made that duck um <laughs> and um and we like packaged it in this box that looks like Ch- chinese food takeaway yep. kind of box because th- that's part of the like the new york folklore of of even the name duck sauce it's sure. just some new york shit um <laughs> And then, uh, maybe year two of Duck Sauce being out, we had some shows to play. And I think one, it was EDC LA in 2010, the last year that it was at uh, in LA. The yeah. Coliseum, I think it was. I, yeah, I remember it was, um, in, it was like the Neon Forester. It was in that. <laughs> I, I saw that was there at the set. But yeah. yeah it was so, <laughs> so in planning for that show where you know we had to play, put duck sauce on a bigger stage we were like you know let's make an inflatable mm-hmm. and um we found a, a a company that makes you know stage inflatables and we sent them this duck <laughs> and we were like can you make us a you know 14 like we found foot... the company that made the duck <laughs> yeah now we need a bigger so it went version. from dust <laughs> to the you know, sort of superhero-ish cartoony duck to celebrity ducks ducks coming from a chance encounter by Nick Catch Dubs at some sort of sporting event. This gives us the shape of the 3D duck. And then when it's time to make an inflatable to put on stage, we sent them this duck and we're like, just make us a big one. That's how the vision happened. (laughs) You premiered it at, it was Hard Summer 2011, I believe, or one of... I forget. I I feel like, I'm having 2010 already now. we had we had yeah. the inflatable one, one of those i remember and then I, that duck evolved over time there was a either 2010 2011 we premiered the inflatable duck on stage who's called shabadoo yeah um wait why is his name shabadoo uh there's the, gotta be a story there yeah for sure everything has a story <laughs> but everything boils everything with duck sauce boils down to me and armand just goofing around and so um <laughs> yeah absolutely we i remember one day just like uh I don't even remember how it came up, but like, um, which like hair metal band has Eddie? Like the character, there's a character on stage. It oh. might have been. It might. I don't know if it's Motley Crue. Um, anyways, the rationale <laughs> was, right, <laughs> you know, in through the years there'd be these bands that had like this like recognizable character on stage that had a name. Um, so we're like, our duck should have a name. <laughs> Obviously, it's a Motley Crue. Fuck. Um, and um. So we're like, let's come up with a name for, for, for our duck. And then, you know, I can just like ask Armand, like his brain's crazy. Like I'll just like, I'll just know. I'll just like put him, give him a mission and he'll just give me like, like spit out something. So I'll be <laughs> yeah. like, Armand, we should name our duck something. And he thinks for a second and he goes, Shabadoo. <laughs> and I start laughing and I'm like, okay, cool. Why? And he's like the movie Breakin. In the movie Breakin, which is like an early hip hop, like one of those classic like, yep. wild style era you know hip hop movies there's the main breakdancer characters there's Shabadoo there's Boogaloo Shrimp and there's well, another he one immediately of... knew yeah yep. so so he was like oh our duck should be named after one of the breakdancers that's in amazing Breakin. and then we had to build a second duck because we kept one in North America and one in Europe because you do that with touring right. uh, you know stage props sometimes so when we made a second duck the other one was Boogaloo Shrimp 
<laughs> and then Shabadoo, at one point, we put lasers in his eyes and we and we put like UV paint on him because um, I think it was he evolved. In tw- yeah, in 2014, we had like another run of shows, and I know we played Coachella that year, but maybe Hard Summer also. We had a couple of like you know shows, and we had already used Shabadoo in like around 2010, 2011. So we're like, oh, we need to update the duck. Shabadoo 2.0. Yeah. 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 Upgrade, so we obviously. put lasers in his eyes. Oh, that's we... Shabadoo 2 electric boogaloo. That ties back into breaking. There you go. Wow. Right there. There you go. Um, no, it's great. Well, when we're on the topic oh, of duck sauce while we're here, um, we got a lot of, we got a lot of topics. I know Val's got a lot too. <laughs> uh, but you know, I haven't slept much this weekend. So like you'll, you can get me to talk about anything and I'm going to forget little pieces, but just, it's great. We'll we're going to stitch it all. Yeah. It's, it's okay. going to be perfect. Yeah. Um, so, Duck Sauce, when when Duck Sauce came out, obviously very inspired by disco, disco house, and a lot of other yeah. uh, you know inspirations that you've incorporated. You know, ahead of its time in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. but now, and you recently kind of brought back Duck Sauce kind of full on and started touring again together. It does it feel like right now is like a really good time for house in in that regard? Um, where if it, like I, I'm wondering yeah. how how Duck Sauce feels for you in. 2023 comparatively yeah Yeah. in this yeah we've never known where we fit um and i think there's kind of like good and i don't want to say bad but less good aspects about we like that part too yeah i want to hear about that no the bad part is that nothing sticks nowadays like there's but that's just like the death of monoculture in general that's beyond house music but like it's there's um there's just less zeitgeist now there's less there's way less of like the song of the year the song of the summer um so, you know, it's a little bit stranger uh, being, you know, being in the scene um, now compared to, you know, 10, 12 years ago when there was more of like these movements. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. But, yeah. you know, I think house music, especially um, in North America, has, you know, a stronger footprint than before. So for better for worse. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And so we can come in with a certain amount of seniority and be like, oh, Duck Sauce is back. And, and you know, just kind of do our thing. But, like, pretty early on, I think we figured out with Duck Sauce that, like, we don't care what's going on, in, you know, at large. And we just kind of do weird shit for our own enjoyment and hopefully people enjoy it. As, when I say I don't care, not not directed at the crowd at all. We love our audience, but more so the industry. Yeah. That's also why we sort of like don't try to sign Duck Sauce to labels that are too too big. Because mm-hmm. we almost did that before the Quack album. We like s- briefly signed to Casablanca, which is which was part of Republic Universal. And then we like signed and then left the label before the album came out. Yeah, well, so I was going <laughs> to ask about that because yeah. when, you know, you kind of had the same spirit when you started Duck Sauce. It was more like, we're just going to do what we kind of want. And then yeah. Barbara Streisand had this meteoric oh, moment. Man. And it was crazy. So I'm, I'm curious because like we're, we're talking about the monoculture in our last episode, yeah. the the um, demise of the monoculture and the fragmentation. But back mm. then, even though this was kind of something that was coming out of a niche area and had this moment kind of wider, the, the, the video for Barbara Streisand is like a who's who of that era. It's also uh, the first viral video in dance music. When really? About it. Yeah, okay. So I mean, I'm, I'm just that. saying, like, when you tell us about that, uh, <laughs> I'm, you know, that that was just the era when YouTube was becoming, you know, predominant. Sure. Um, I really remember that around the time we were making that video, even like music video directors and artists were starting to realize that MTV was playing less and less videos, and if you're making a music video, it doesn't even have to follow these rigid rules that mm-hmm. used to exist to have your video play on TV mm-hmm. because that's not even, that's not really where the conversation is yeah. that much anymore. It's, it's more just about direct the to internet. consumer, yeah. direct to audience. So, because even the way that we added a lot of live audio to the Barbra Streisand video, you hear Questlove playing drums over it. There's a Barbra Streisand impersonator. I'm, I'm always bugged out that people still think that was the, the real, real Barbara Streisand. <laughs> There's a Barbra Streisand impersonator who's yeah. like talking in the intro. I'm scratching over a part. There's all these like things on top. Um, Ezra from Vampire Weekend is like wooing, <laughs> singing, yeah. Yeah. you know. And I, I remember there was a brief conversation of like, is it okay to like have the audio of your video be different from the song that people can buy? Mm-hmm. Um, because people were still thinking in these sort of like tv video rules and we're like hey this is for the internet doesn't matter and we put it put out the video and it like just spread like wildfire yeah 
there was people in other cities like the video is really a sort of ode to new york it's a love story to new york mm -hmm. um and there'd be people in other cities making their version of the barbara streisand video you know diy with their friends for their city like mm -hmm. there'd be like there's like someone in like warsaw poland making their version of barbara streisand video in warsaw someone did it for paris you know a bunch of cities and the song was you know even bigger in europe than in here so we saw more of that in europe but um yeah it kind of was the first viral video of of, of um of dance music because it, it also just it was that moment in time where the internet just kind of took over yeah. you know and i would say the next one after that was was harlem shake yeah totally you know <laughs> totally oh my gosh yeah. that's so true and yeah that, but like yeah. you know I've had conversations with Bauer about like what it feels like when you have a song that just like blows up so much that it's like it's bigger than you. Out, yeah, mm -hmm. it's bigger than you. It's out of your hands. There's people that that know you in other walks of life, other parts of the scene that don't even feel like your scene that, you know, suddenly become your fan and have expectations for your next songs and labels want a piece of it, but labels don't realize that like we just kind of caught we got lucky, man. We just like made a lightning it. strike. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, for Armand and I, um, uh, the next song after Barbara Streisand, we like consciously didn't make another song like Barbara Streisand because you can't. What are you gonna do? Make another loop, another disco song, and and you know, yeah, say uh, Eleanor Rigby or whatever some other <laughs> name like <laughs> yeah. you know, and in, and in, and in, in obviously in other capacities, people have adopted that. You know, like there's a sh song called Jackie Chan. And I hear it all, you know, it's, sure, yeah. it's Post Malone's talking about Jackie Chan, you yeah, know? And it's, yeah. And, but I think that there's something about Barbara Streisand that is like a one of one. Yeah. You know? So we, after that, we did the Big Bad Wolf, which is like very different from Barbara Streisand. Totally. And I remember like the new Duck Sauce fans, like that song is, is, is like a, like a wedding song. Like I'm not saying people walk down the aisle, but it's a song that plays <laughs> like, like wait, at someone's quinceanera, <laughs> yeah. someone's bar mitzvah, someone's wedding, like. It's not. It's not for. It, it. It went way beyond the house. It was in commercials. Yeah, it was, yeah, it yeah. was all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was it, inescapable. It was, yeah. So we had these new Duck Sauce fans who weren't really in the house music scene. They were like twelve-year-olds and you know, yeah, anyone. Yeah, yeah in in <laughs> yeah. in Budapest. Um, and so we put out the Big Bad Wolf after that, and so many of those new fans were like, "What's this?" But we like that. Like we just kind of like. Less, we like messing with people a little bit yeah. and having fun with it and just not doing what people expect because there was even this expectation with Duck Sauce to do like disco house for a long time and right. like a lot of the samples we use aren't even disco they have a disco feel but they're like we you know we would sample like weird 80s new wave bands that would like try to make a disco song but yeah sound a little weird <laughs> and we would sample that well instead, that's why i know? tried to that's avoid so leading yeah. with the disco like it's a component of duck sauce but it's not <laughs> like the genre or it's not yeah. the, well you know i think the real um defining trait of duck sauce music is 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 uh like a joyful emotion it's mm. it's mm -hmm. like you know people feel good when they're at a duck sauce show our visuals are completely ridiculous shabadoo is on stage looking handsome as ever that handsome devil yeah and um in our <laughs> song the music that we play at, has this joyful emotion so it's more yeah. about that than literally are we sampling you know a, a disco record per se yeah. so um, but yeah, we made Big Bad Wolf after, which was, you know, way more of like a witch doctor meets, you know, cashmere ish Chicago house record. Oh, it's um, it's great. I mean, yeah. I'm also yeah. curious before we move on past uh, Barbara Streisand, you said you talked to about the Harlem Shake like effect. Yeah. And I'm curious, like what that conversation was like, because I feel like <clears throat> it's interesting hearing about that back then. And now we're in the exact same place, but in a modern way. And so much so is about like chasing the viral. Chasing yeah, the, everybody like, wants that TikTok. Everyone moment. wants that moment. Yeah. yeah, but you made a conscious decision to not. I mean, I'm not saying we don't want to make a hit. I'd be, you know, yeah. la 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 is out now. Like, go stream that shit. Like, yeah, listen, yeah. <laughs> stream that. Make now. it viral. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Let's do it. Like, yeah. we're definitely not a, like. Oh, it's, well, I'm not saying we never want it to be big. I'm, I'm. Duck Sauce brought me to places I, I've never been as a track. Sure. You know, or where maybe Heads Will Roll is the only taste I had of that level of success. Duck Sauce is just a much bigger act and and i'm infinitely grateful and i hope we have fucking seven hits as big as barbara streisand but it was never made with the intent of being yep. a hit we thought it was a silly b-side that we played to our friends yeah 
as like a hey you'll never believe what we did because we're really stupid <laughs> um and and it just happened to blow up and we i think we sort of like um decided afterwards to just continue making songs that tickle us in some way like just continue making songs where we're like oh this is ridiculous i can't believe like we still you know we have like eight new songs that are coming out in the next couple months with la 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 being the first of that but there's like more in the new year and everything and we really went back into that feeling of like making these tracks where as we're making it we're telling ourselves i can't believe we're getting away with this or like mm, are yeah. we really doing this yes we're doing it and I think that's one of the things when you're part of a duo where you can you feel like you can get away with more or like you can psych each other up where like as one person you could just be like, I can't. I can't. Yeah. This, like this, I shouldn't this. do this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I don't have the balls. And when it's you and your buddy, you're like, yeah, you get into like Beavis and Butthead. Shabadoo. Like, you're yeah. daring each other. <laughs> we are, Duck point. Sauce yeah. is Beavis and Butthead basically. Yeah. And yeah. and we, we just psych each other up and we and we do it. And then there's a moment, there's brief moments where we actually use some sort of expertise to like – you know, maybe it's in the mix downs or whatever else where we try to get the songs to work a certain way. Yeah. Or to like get a little more serious about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little bit for, for brief moments. And then we get back into silly mode and yeah. and, and Beavis and Butthead mode. And yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because um well, I, I think in a in a way, like music now more than ever, because we're talking about the the vehicles in which people discover it, it yeah. doesn't really exist in a linear chronology anymore. Mm -hmm. So oh, like, for sure. For sure. Um you know, kind of psychos you're talking about Bauer. I was also going to mention Hudson Mohawk. He had a moment yeah. with Seabat yeah, kind of right. coming back That's over right. 10 years he later. Yeah. Now, these two artists are actually going to be playing at the Fool's Gold 15th anniversary yeah. Oof, show. What a good segue. I, you know, Very good. To. You've had a lot of good segues I, today. You know, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm trying Off to, you know. Yeah. F1, just like going around <laughs> the track. Facing um, the, 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 the chessboard. <laughs> uh, right. But yeah, so tell us about, so we're going to be celebrating here in LA, uh, Friday, December segue. 1st. <laughs> Uh, tell us about the lineup. You got Bauer, we got yep. Hudson Mohawk, and this is kind of... So I've been wanting to do a Fool's Gold LA show for a couple years. It's been a while. There was even a point in time where we kind of stopped doing Fool's Gold Day Off in LA. Not because we wanted to. We we would have happily continued, but like the LA live event space got so crowded. Mm -hmm. I think like, I don't know if people realize, you know, uh, from the outside, or even people who live in LA how tough it became to throw events, even to get a budget from a venue, um, when, you know, when there's just so many, um, you know, corporate-backed festivals totally. in the same market. So to get a venue with a budget and to even be able to accomplish some sort of lineup with bookings when, you know, so many of the artists that we're friends with or that we might want to book have a radius clause or they're mm -hmm. playing their own, you know, headline show on their tour or maybe they're playing. At one point it was F FYF, then it was Flognaut, then it was Rolling Loud, you know, but then there's also Coachella. EDC Vegas has a radius that goes all the way to L.A., mm -hmm. you know, or, yeah, or a simple headline show at, at, at you know, uh, the Fonda. Or Everyone's else. L.A. play has to be impactful now. Yeah. You know, that's a yeah. huge part. So we come in a little bit as outsiders and a bunch of our friends – artist friends are down to play our shows but in the conversation with the agents it becomes like there's just all these roadblocks sure. you know so there's a point in time where we start we did fool's gold day off as a sort of like piggyback thing at complex con for like mm -hmm. three years i think and that was a cool solution where we were able to kind of use some of their muscle um and then that was before the pandemic when the pandemic happened blah 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 it's been years since we've done a fool's gold la show um and um but we're celebrating the 15th anniversary this year we've been doing all these anniversary events um a lot of them in new york but some stuff in miami and i really wanted us to have an la show and in fact we even tried we had a date held at the bellwether in august and even then we ran into all these roadblocks with agents and radius clauses and all this stuff and we sure. had to like push it back a little bit so finally finally december 1st um we're doing fool's gold la which is that show is a little bit of like a sister show to what we did at Webster Hall in New York in June. So it's kind of like um, leaning into like the electro side of Fool's Gold and it's, you know, um, pretty DJ heavy also um, with a couple of choice live performances. So uh, myself and Hudmo playing back to back, which is really fun. We've only played together once. I've known mm. Ross forever um, since he was at like the Red Bull Music Academy. So we, I've known him for a really long time. 
Um, but we've only played together once before, playing in L.A. Bauer, again, like just telling that anecdote about the Harlem Shake and, and the timeline of that. Like we share a timeline together yeah. between Fool's Gold and him. And you've made a lot of music. You made music he together. He and I toured together and before. So we did a little EP together. Great friend, amazing artist. Um, I love his new shit too. Um, Naeem Spankrock is playing the show. He played the New York show too. He, awesome. again, super important to the history of Fool's Gold. Club Eat. So now now you go into some of the newer acts. Because I, th I think like, you know, the Bloghouse era of Fool's Gold was very involved with this sort of... Um, hybrid electro sound and there's like a new family of groups that to me are doing like a newer version of that yeah so um I, i'm really into uh club eat the music they they make shallow halo is also on the bill i would put them in that category too of like new band that makes me think of stuff i really liked yeah in 2008 but it, the new version frankie chan's playing the show um, shout out Frank Chan. Shout out Frankie. <laughs> iHeart Comics is involved with the show. Space, cool. Space Yacht is helping us promote. Um, Cobra Snake is shooting and, and 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 is you know behind the scenes too. Wow. So yeah, it's, oh. it's a whole all back. yeah, it's a whole celebration. And even you know to do it at the Bellwether, this new venue that just is is you know having a good moment. Um, yeah. This at, at this this season of of shows in LA. So we're super psyched. I mean, um. When we put together the plan for these uh, 15th anniversary events that we've been doing throughout the year, um, there was kind of this this uh, brainstorm at the end of last year to plan out this year, where at first we were like, okay, do we bring back Day Off? Do we do like one big show in LA or sorry, in New York? And like, you know, do we do we try to find like the one celebratory party that we try to get everyone at? Mm -hmm. But again, with that sort of like, you know siloed culture thing that we were just talking about how there's not really like it's so hard to get the one moment or like the one act or the one this or that anymore we decided to um i also think that like the whole scene feels like it's still picking up the pieces after the pandemic yeah. so we decided to like check in with like multiple pockets that to us make up you know the 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 very like three-dimensional a vision of fool's gold that we have rather than just aiming for one thing taking one swing and 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 you know putting everything on that so in new york in particular we really uh did a bunch of different events where we had a residency at public records um that was you know a little bit more for like the connoisseur djs so we yeah. had dj shadow at one of the shows we had ronson and um yeah, you Mark know we, ronson for those who don't, you know, Mark Ronson know. killed it. By the way, his set yeah. is online. Go listen to it. It, it. it might be the best DJ set I've heard this year. Oh, wow! Um, oh, wow. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Public Records was kind of like for the DJ foundation of Fool's Gold. Um, we did a an awesome Fashion Week party back in February, in uh, in New York. Also, that was like a little bit more for like the sort of streetwear and like mm. hype rapper kind of seeing like the new 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 names of rappers that are just starting to bubble and like um yeah that's sort of like hype and fashion side of the scene we're in uh we booked this guy chucky 73 chucky 73 who's like this like <laughs> dominican bronx rapper that makes like the most insane music videos and and we had cash cobain and a bunch of awesome djs too um and then our our webster hall uh party in new york was kind of the higher profile uh um tentpole for mm -hmm. the new york series of events that was kind of like how i described the la show this vision where we're like hey let's connect the dots between classic fool's gold um especially on the sort of like myspace blog electro side of things and like tie the loop you know put our curator hat on and tie the loop with like the newer acts that yeah. are doing something that we're digging now in that sense you know so in New York to have Uffy and the Frost Children on the same scene, that was an important statement to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, Frost Children, um, The Help, Club Eat, these newer acts that we're really into. But then, yeah, putting uh, Afi, Naeem, myself, I played a blog house set um, and a couple of other acts. Like that was kind of like, yeah, us kind of making a statement with a show and doing it at Webster Hall where so many of our early shows worse and yeah. so this la show is like in that vision of you know us reminding people that nowadays there's a ton of there's a ton of you know s small festivals you know uh curated events uh a ton of 
a ton of shows that'll have like the buzzing act of the moment. We're we're not the only curators in town because there's a period of time where maybe we were like, mm-hmm. or there weren't the, there weren't that many for a couple of years. Totally, people yeah. making these like, you know the the you know shows that have like whoever was cool on SoundCloud at, at the time. Like there weren't that many people putting those acts on a stage yeah. then. Now there are um, plenty of great shows to see, and I'm glad that the scene grew. But we're sort of you know we still have I think you know, a point of view that's uniquely ours. So what we're le- leaning into for our show is sort of like, all right, well, what's the, what's the fool's gold point of view? What's the cosign that we want to give? Or who are we psyched about now? Yeah. Like just not being shy to, to be like, this is our opinion. This is our taste. This is our vision. And, um, you know, sometimes it's not even the, the easiest point to get across because, you know, in some cases at this point, I've, I've been organizing these like, you know, combo lineup shows for a long time. You know, there's even the 8-Track and Friends franchise that we can talk about uh, after this. Um, Sometimes I feel like if I put, like, one or two names on the flyer, it would be an easier sell. Like, the tickets would fly faster than when I'm putting eight names on the flyer. Because when I put eight names on the flyer, I'm, I'm making a point, I'm making a statement, I'm saying, I'm asking people who are just scrolling on their feed fast and, you know, people don't even feel like stopping and looking at a flyer. I'm asking them to look and be like, hey... Don't you see this thing that I'm seeing that when you put all this stuff together, it kind of gels? Mm. That's what that, you know, and I'll be like, this is, you know, it's almost like doing a mix where I'm like, right. in my view, this stuff gels together. Do you want to come see our show and we'll show you how it gels together? Yeah. And then you come to a Fool's Gold show and there's also a bunch of surprises. And there's also like the cool photographer at the moment that's like hanging out, taking pics and all this other stuff that comes with it. Yeah. Um, you think definitely- having a lineup might be a harder ask? sometimes yeah it is but it takes but, people like a little bit longer to think about it i think that's yeah the thing, for right? sure exactly yeah. but but you know there's so many things that i've done in my career that are sometimes the longer endeavor the longer you know mission but they pay off in the long run mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know same way that with my tracks if i if i if i made like a you know a formula of remixes where i did similar remixes and you know, throughout uh, a dozen of, you know, similar sounding things in a row. Um, there's periods in my career where I probably could have like ascended faster or like really, you know, hit a moment in a certain way. But um, but I also think that those things fade. And, and with events, sure, you can put one name that's from our LA show and maybe literally sell those tickets faster than when I'm putting, you know, six or seven names. But people still talk about that the feeling, the special feeling that came from that curatory thing yep. at, at mm-hmm. some of our shows over the years yep. in a certain way. And I'm super grateful that people still talk about that. That people, Like like you said, if you're like, you're naming a specific year of Day Off LA, like, yeah, 2015, yeah. Post Malone opening. And totally. by the way, I remember how cheap we paid for know. you know his set and, <laughs> and he played he, oh he did a white iverson i think three times you know he didn't have a lot he of had songs like three out. four songs out. <laughs> he didn't have, yeah it but was people remember early. seeing right him time. and you know wh- i don't remember if that year was like the mac miller no i think or... i think i think travis scott did close that one yeah and uh um, remember seeing travis and danny and post yep. and like maybe the scratch pickles right like, and people remember seeing that and I'm combining a couple, you know, lineups, but just as an example, people remember the experience of like taking in all these interesting bits of music mm-hmm. and how that felt. I think that leaves a longer impression yeah. than like, I went to see one act and it was great because that was the act of the moment of the year. And, well, I think that know, that's what we were talking about on a previous episode about because things are becoming more siloed, you mm-hmm. know, we're going to run into like a headliner kind mm-hmm. of dilemma in the future yeah. where we think that it, in a positive way, the collective top to bottom is going to be the cell rather than the top, I mean, the bottom to top rather than the top to bottom. Right. right? Yeah. Because, you know, honestly, culture and community will be stronger, I think, than an individual. Well, um, I think it makes sense too, like thinking back on it now, because I actually feel like that era and like what you're talking about, like approaching a party with a more like curatorial, not only with the lineup, but just like the whole vibe of the party Mm -hmm. that kicked off a whole thing in LA because there was a whole era in LA where like there were parties that were known for that. Like I spent half my life at Mix Mag Lab. (laughs) So like I remember exactly what that era was like. And then that went away. Right. I feel like we've been in this period now where like that's been gone for a while, but exactly what Chad was just saying, like now people care more about 
the smaller names and like the vibe of like what they're gonna go see. So I think yeah, we're back. I mean, yeah. so so I've also since the pandemic, I've been doing these A Track and Friends shows. Also, um, a bunch of those in Miami, yep. but a few in other cities too. <clears throat> and A Track and Friends is a little bit more on the house sides compared to Fool's Gold events that lean kind of hip hop or electro. And um, yeah, A Track and Friends. Uh, you know, we we sort of there's there's like um it's like a, a feel good um element to the music and the bookings and there's a lot of like veteran house DJs that we combine with whoever's the newer buzzing you know DJ and and um we try to make those events free as much as possible. All the Miami ones have been free, so I just announced the other day um the one that we're doing during Basel, so December eighth, a week after the LA show, we're doing a Dragon Friends in um in Miami. And, you know, on the main stage it's like me and Lee Foss and Roger Sanchez and Nick Leon, who I think is like having a great year. So just to put Nick Leon on the same stage as Roger Sanchez, like that's a very, mm -hmm. you know, a track and fool's gold approach <laughs> yeah, to yeah. curation. <laughs> yeah. Um but then we have the side room that's a, a surf gang takeover with snow strippers and a couple of other acts. And it's been cool to to both of your points, seeing people even in the comments, react so much over snow strippers and surf gang who are playing in the side room. Right. When you know you have these big DJ names on the main stage. Sure. It's fun to see people get excited about you know the acts that are like buzzing right now and that are just like on their way up. Yeah. Because that's we've always loved to champion those acts the most. Anyways, like we'll we would always figure out stunts to be able to book some sort of legend because I might know someone or whatever. But we tend to be more psyched you know, to book someone that's got like three songs out, but that we just really believe in. Well, I think that's kind of the trouble with, you know, as things become a little bit more um, a la carte or fragmented and you have these like pockets, like I think the these bigger people are looking at flawed metrics where they're like, oh, monthly <laughs> listeners or this many yeah. followers. But there's this real community movement stuff oh, happening sure. and you have yeah. to be really tapped in to see it, yeah. you know? Yeah, I, I always say like, for, as far as the last couple of years in 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 like music and in the industry, there's there's too much data, and I think there's so much data that it's actually not telling us anything. Right. Like it's it's useless. Yeah. There's way too much of it, and you're right. There's a lot of bookers that'll only look at someone's monthly listeners to um to decide their bookings or decide like the billing on the festival flyer or whatever. They need to look at like the merch numbers or other shit or you know yeah. or just like there's like a human element <laughs> yeah. like go to yeah. the shows and see what people yeah. are excited about there's yeah. too there's too many metrics and people are putting too much importance on metrics um you know everyone's you know the twitter debates about people's first week streams and mm -hmm. sales and like those are not the releases that leave a lasting imprint on yeah. on culture some of them are some of them aren't but like that's not the defining metric it's one it's one way out of many to analyze the mm -hmm. performance of, you know, something, a project, whatever. Yeah. But we've, we've all been to shows that are like half empty, but that changed the game. Right. We've all been to a show where yeah. the room is half empty and like the next 10 years of what, what you go to was affected by something yeah. that happened in that room. Right. You no, know? It, it, that's and like, yeah. People forget that when they're making all these corporate decisions based off of you know, who sold out what size room or whatever. Well, that's because we're, we're finding a, a very a discrepancy between people who are, you know, results oriented <clears throat> and process oriented. Yeah. The people who are process oriented, they have no problem playing that half empty show on the way to the big shit, mm -hmm. you know, but you have to go through that. You can't just expect everyone to just be discovered on a TikTok and then just be ready to just kill it in a show. Like if saying. they didn't, yeah, yeah. if they didn't go through that, <laughs> kind of that grind you know because we've talked about it in our in our scene a lot of people are obsessed with the steps mm -hmm. and you got to go through the steps yeah and i think the gamifying of and i'd love for you to hear your opinion on it like because people are utilizing short form and these other means of like kind of skipping some of the steps mm -hmm. like i think that some people in this day and age are kind of like they feel it, it's a little bit a lot more trivial and kind of like uh, it doesn't have the same weight as like but is that kind of like our bias because we came up from a different time or do you think yeah, there's some weight to that? Yeah, it's 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 all complicated. <laughs> it's so complicated. But you know, it's it's easy to sort of um dismiss like the short form generation and you know, kind of be like, "Oh man, you know, these younger acts that are blowing up off of TikTok, they didn't they never had to load in their own backline out of any." <laughs> yeah. But the truth is 
there's so many artists that are blowing up on you know whether it's tiktok or any you know short form content that are super talented there's a lot yeah. like there's so much talent out there yeah and i do think there's some level of natural selection that happens where like the ones that are able to like fill a room and and um put together an hour plus set that you know is captivating even if they first get noticed for mm -hmm. 30 seconds like th there's some of those you know survive the yeah the that sort of like it's just a more public fallout now. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah 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 it's it, the hard it's, part yeah it's all public um but i i do think there's a there might be more talent than ever it's um yeah i i just i wish um i wish that some of the you know institutions or 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 like the you know i wish some of the people in positions to really get behind artists um we're able to not only go by the stats and really follow their gut more and mm -hmm. take swings you know on something that like might completely tank the first couple tries but like might end up also completely changing the course of history going oh. off of their gut more than stats and numbers because like there's such a big side of the music industry you know and this goes to the a and r scout game too that looks like um finance oh, you know yeah. trackers yeah. you know like there's <laughs> there's entire departments like every major label has custom software built just for them to track spikes of certain artists yeah and there's artists that they follow in the in our meetings and their little software tells them oh they just had a moment on TikTok or on SoundCloud or they, you know, here's how their touring is doing. All that stuff is cool, but that's how my financial analyst also talks. Totally. Like music shouldn't <laughs> yeah. be talked about that way. Right. And I'll, I'll guarantee you one thing. Most of those people were not in the room when that, when that show was happening. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I think that is important too, you know, just yeah. getting yeah. in, getting in that crowd. And yeah. Just like, like we're not tracking it. fucking stocks and bonds here. Like this isn't <laughs> Moneyball. Like it's, it's there, there's a human connection that needs to happen. Um, and, um, yeah, I just I don't want that to to get lost. Yeah. And um so I do think that like the human curators are probably more important than ever because all these all the algorithmic uh curation rarely has the element of a surprise, the element yeah. of surprise of of a human, you know? When 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 Netflix or Spotify tells you you'll probably like this, they are saying that because they're recommending something that is similar to other things you've listened to mm -hmm. and that other pe people who listen to that one thing also listen to. Yeah. So they're making a predictable uh, um, call, recommendation, yeah. right? And all the stuff that we treasure, you know, all the ballsy changes in history are non-predictable. You know, like we all remember, you know, when it was like the first time that, I don't know, that you saw MIA live or the first time that you heard electric feel by mgmt or you know any yeah. of these moments um or even the first time that like s like someone rapped off beat but it kind of worked mm, <laughs> or, like yeah, all these yeah. things that happened <laughs> in the last 10 15 years that like turned out to be super influential and different and cool um n you know no algorithm will predict that mm -hmm. they're only going to give you the thing like they make the circle go smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller yeah. and then they wonder why stuff doesn't stick well, as someone who's collected extensive physical media and vinyl and you were obviously digging and digging is like a huge part of, you know, all cultures mm -hmm. uh, that music related, like there is a, a thing that Spotify provides in the digging capacity that is like really helpful. Mm -hmm. But do you feel like because it's like alongside all of the other new releases that it just kind of gets lost or, or is it? Directing people more to just like stay within their comfort zone as because just think what's unfortunate and it's not even I, I, I always see people demonize and I want to be careful how I say this. Yeah. I see people demonize Spotify a lot and I'm not saying that Spotify isn't a demon, but <laughs> I think it's like the industry of DSPs of streaming services in general that has really done something to what we have access to as listeners and what we have access to as artists and labels. Um, and they've sort of like flattened out any other options. Like literally when, when streaming services became predominant, you know, the powers that be shut down all the music blogs that had like 
cool, right. weird mixtapes that were never officially released and yeah. like just, you know, little regional unofficial shit. Everything got like all these blogs got, you know, cease and desist letters and, and, and were closed down. And, and yeah. there's all this bizarre music that doesn't fit anywhere that you literally maybe you can find it on YouTube. Right. But you can barely find where, it anymore. YouTube is the last bastion. That's it. <laughs> and That's who knows what's going to happen with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's not even just about Spotify. I think part of the reason why we talk about Spotify so much is is their their you know their rates <laughs> suck. And yeah. but their numbers are so public. Yes. You know when you go on Apple Music, you can't see like the numbers for the top five or yeah. ten songs mm -hmm. of an artist the way that Spotify does. But um, I think all those streaming services. I really remember a moment in time. It's not that long ago. It's, it's like. 2017 maybe yeah. when the street when the music industry turned a profit for the first time in like 15 years mm. and i was having all these meetings with leor cohen at the time who's you know an industry big dog who had just successfully founded um 300 the label and was about to take a job at youtube and we were talking about like a possible thing involvement with fool's gold which we ended up not doing uh, but he, you know, I had I had some interesting conversations with him that you know where I, there was a lot of takeaway um, for me at the time. But I remember really observing what was happening to the music industry at that point in time, where for the first time in years, you know, like he was helping Google invest in record labels. Mm -hmm. That was not happening in two thousand nine or two thousand eleven. Yeah, totally. Corporate America, finance America, you know, banking America was not getting behind labels. Um, the music industry turned a profit. I th it was either 2016, 17, something like that, for the first time in like 10, 15 years. And now, now, now like people smell blood and like corporate America <laughs> wanted in, wanted to invest. I remember there was all these conversations that they were like, oh, um, you know, the music industry is just going to keep growing its profit because, you know, uh, Spotify and these streaming services, they're not even, they're not in India yet. They're not in Africa mm -hmm. yet. They're not in mm -hmm. China yet. Da, 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 da. So as it goes into th these other territories, there's going to be more money. And it was just money, 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 all this, all this talk. And when that happens, the industry comes in with its elbows like this <laughs> and they go, all right, we're, we're at the table now. You know, a few years after that, it's what we saw in recent years with catalog purchases when literally banks are buying people's catalogs. Yep. When that, when those things happen, yeah, the, the, the big structures come in and they go, okay, this is how we're playing and we need to make sure that our investments are protected and safe. So let's go and close up shop for like anyone that's sort of alternative because yeah. this needs to be regulated and legit. And the disappearance of blogs is such a fucking huge loss, man. Like there's so much great music that, that we can't find. Yeah. You know? And, and journalism to some degree is... It, it doesn't exist what in journalism? let's just let's just say <laughs> let's journalism? just say yeah um that that is interesting i well raj is on this topic i gotta yeah, get this yeah. one because we were, we were having a uh, lunch and you had mentioned something really interesting about music that within the zeitgeist and like the current media landscape like you know people ask well what are you what are you watching on netflix uh what movies have you seen mm -hmm. recently what podcasts what, are you listening what to, podcasts are you listening to? <laughs> which comes before or even this question doesn't even get asked. What album are you listening to? For sure. What are yeah. you bumping? So yeah. why has music kind of receded from the foreground and become more of like a background or ancillary, you know, um, media product? Mm. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm trying to, because yeah, this is something that I comment on often, but I'm trying to answer the why. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, maybe it's just the ways in which um, things can be commodified. Like, you know, if you really look at how, um, you know, the ways that like corporate machine is able to make money off a podcast with like, you know, advertising in the, in the middle of the listen and, and, you know, st uh, streaming content, film and TV on, on streaming platforms, God knows like the way that they make a profit on that. Maybe those are just more like easier to, to commodify and make profits on compared to music releases that um you know have a certain cycle or maybe like our shorter format i'm not i'm i i can't really come up with the why right but that's definitely a thing yeah and music has definitely become more replaceable and um it's i think it even has to do with like behaviorally what people are doing when they listen to albums 
Like, there's something about the ease of, I hate, I hate to be a boomer and be like, no, no, you listen to your music <laughs> on this. Right. But, like, the fact that you can listen to uh, albums on your commute more than before and to more music, uh, you know, in every little moment of your, of your day, paradoxically, makes that music less important in your day because you don't need to, like, sit and focus as much. Totally. Yeah. So it becomes, it becomes a background vibe. Right. And so I think like people have like certain vibes that they go to throughout their day yeah. and that can be a playlist or that could be an, a, an album or an artist, but those things are cyclical and replaceable way more than before. Well, and so also, if you yeah. think there's a certain type of rap album, um, the albums that are doing well increasingly are albums that have a similar vibe for the whole length of that album because people want to listen to that like a playlist and they're listening to that release by an artist when they when they're in that specific mood so maybe there's a certain type of i don't know chill house that someone listens to on their commute and then a month later that same um curator or label or artist or, or whatever might have a new release that takes up that space of that day for that listener so that album that was listened to only lasts about if you're lucky a few weeks in that person's life because it's that person doesn't even get to fall in love and, and have, you know, deep connections with that body of work. Yeah. It just becomes like, sometimes I say like music is becoming like the scented, ca the scented candle. Like it's, <laughs> oh, I want this mood right now. Let me go to this playlist. Wow, that's a there. really good analogy, that's actually. Really good. It's just, it's a background <laughs> vibe, but you're, you're not right. spending intentional time with it the yeah. same way that, you know, I guess it's just because there's too much choice. Right. You know, I just feel like have... it, it relates to what you were talking about before because I feel like it's just harder to have a deeper connection with it because of the algorithm because it's like not – you don't feel like anything is – nothing is underground anymore. You know what I yeah. mean? I mean, look – yeah, there's yeah. that. I also think that there's just so much of it that things become replaceable more than before. Like there's there's just more similar types of albums and releases that come out and those things get pushed to the front of your app when you open it. So yeah. as a listener, you're just sort of like – Filling a thing, like choosing a thing that fills that place or that void in that part of your day where you want that vibe. Yeah. So it's way more of a vibe than a thing you connect with. And like, it's funny, like sometimes we talk about like the, like the Play Bad Bunny thing, like the phone request with DJs. <laughs> but like. It's always so Bad Bunny too. So real. Well, he's just Literally. the biggest artist in the world. But like, but the Bad Bunny thing is funny because sometimes I'll see. I'll observe the person that's hold, holding the phone <laughs> and I'll think, does that person literally want Bad Bunny or do they just want that vibe? The, the Bad Bunny vibe. <laughs> because. <laughs> totally. Like you the party. Bad Bunny scented candle. You know, there's also, speaking of vibes and, and speaking of Montreal, I've now there's parties that are like sort of Catronada themed parties where it's not oh, Catron no. himself playing. It's DJs playing music that has that bounce. For the whole night and i'm not knocking anyone that's doing those parties there's, there's people i know who do those yeah. parties but that has become a vibe props to k he literally came up with like a type of production and all the way down to a swing to his drums mm -hmm. that defines a vibe and if you talk about everything being siloed so everyone has these couple of silos that they know they enjoy but if someone is asking for Bad Bunny or if someone is saying, hey, let's go to the k Trinata themed parties, do they, not to be that guy that's like, name me three songs, but like, do they actually <laughs> like that artist's work specifically beyond a couple songs or do they just sort of like skim through it, like the way they feel when they hear something in that vicinity, yeah. but also like other similar things. And they're like, yeah. and they decide, you know what, that's a vibe that I'm enjoying on my Thursday evening or on my subway ride to work or whatever. And that, becomes like a a, a, um, a vibe that they want to go to at one point in their week. No, I, but and, those things yeah. are more cyclical and I replaceable think, yeah. than before. Well, that, that's kind of what we were talking about to that point is that, you know, like I was comparing like, let's say the fame of like Ludacris in the 2000s to Jack Harlow, right? Yeah. And what I had said is that Ludacris required millions <laughs> of people to go out and actually buy a physical CD. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. it, it kind of becomes part of your identity mm -hmm. because that's hard work money that mm -hmm. you earned and then you had to, so you're kind of going to own it. if Unless the album sucked, you're going to be like, I'm riding with this, right? <laughs> yeah. Whereas Jack Harlow, like you're saying, like you don't have to go without out of the comfort zone of your phone. Yeah, and you're sure just that. like, oh, yeah, I heard it. Yeah, yeah the album's cool. Yeah. All right, what's next? What's no, next, I'm Friday? I'm thinking about my own journey, actually. And I, I talk about Fredigan probably a little too much on this podcast, but it's just such an 
relatable figure right now. Yeah, it's and interesting because because he is one of the few artists that like a lot yes. of people are going to see. Yes, but I think what was interesting is like through this whole conversation, I was thinking about why when I first discovered him, it felt different than other albums that I listened to in dance mm -hmm. music because I think there was that like unexpected element of pandemic time. And obviously, mm -hmm. I think that's why his music resonated so much because it was very emotional about human connection and mm -hmm. that's what people really wanted at right. that moment yeah. but now it's obviously gone way bigger than that and i think we've reached the point where people are like oh i just like the vibe of fred again mm -hmm. like i just like the stutter house vibe i want to go yeah. experience that mm -hmm. and like that connection isn't really there anymore and i almost i dare say that i felt that at the shows because we talked about his show run in la recently mm -hmm. and i think they're like i think as an artist he did a really good job of like staying true to like doing something unique for his music. Mm -hmm. But you could feel the crowd had some sort of a disconnect because I think they were in it to get the vibe rather mm -hmm. than like, oh, I'm a fan of like his songs. I mean, but he's done a really good job at like capturing even a lot of the behaviors that people have. Like, you know, just oh, yeah. this, the, the, the camera feed, the screen on yeah. him and including, you know, phone camera feed of other people's in yes. the crowd that being part of the show and part of his performances and that is such a, a part of our everyday habit Very is, meta. yeah mm -hmm. so so you know I, I think he like you know captures these things that are part of how people experience their day-to-day -day media conception or whatever mm -hmm. yeah. but like you know there's there's a lot of things that are that we're losing <laughs> in yeah. in music and culture now and there's a lot of things that you know we're all trying to sort of recapture or or you know, uh, uh, keep a certain value to, but I do think that the live experience is not going away. No. And, you know, that's why like some of these shows that we're talking about and, and like, if anything, a show, um, still feels like a moment more than an album release does. Yeah. Yeah. You that know? is the greatest Definitely. like expression of, of support that a fan can give an artist now is going to their live show. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, so when you guys, yeah. you know, and I'm super happy to see how BNL has has continued to grow as as curators and and you know uh, an an events company that has like a real point of view. So when you guys do those shows and people go and really feel connected to the rise of some of these artists, I think that's really that's mm -hmm. really important Thanks. and like yeah for sure and and that's what you know we're trying to continue to do with the Fool's Gold shows too. I know that 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 LA show is going to um have that kind of you know um, feeling to it where people like because I the it's it's similar enough to the New York show that we did and I've noticed how people talk about that New York show mm -hmm. people there will be like oh I remember what I heard that night or you know yeah or someone going to see Bauer or Hudmo might not know Club Eat or might not expect to see Club Eat or Shallow Hollow and then they'll discover those acts that day and be like oh man I, this one time I went to a Fool's Gold show and I was going to see Hudmo and 8-Track, but then I saw this other artist that I started yeah. listening to. Like, that's, I mean, to me, that's like a responsibility that we have to, you know. And it still works. No matter I what hope. the, it like, if the people show up and they discover those early acts, that is still the best way. And hearing songs live yeah. is still the best way for songs to blow up. Like, yeah, these yeah. things have maintained throughout um, the 15 years of Fool's Gold and, and all of it. And, I mean, I think the Bellwether is a great, venue for this to be at because it's new mm -hmm. and it but it has that it has a character and a feel that reminds us of like the, a very a, you know bygone golden era as well <laughs> like it it kind of ties all together because downtown i think was a really big part of all of our you know experience throughout yeah. the years yeah yeah. yeah 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 so yeah we're excited for the show yeah cool. it's gonna be great yeah, good. wow I feel like we could talk for so much longer. I know. That was I, very enlightening. I'm just I here. I know. We really, really, really danced around a few of them. Also, but. we need to take you to eat pizza in LA is what I've learned. Sure. Because apparently I you've never seen some. a slice of pizza in LA. I don't, really I don't believe there is pizza in LA. Uh, <laughs> okay. Prove it. We'll, we will have to prove it. Uh, A-Track, thank you so much for coming through. Thanks. Thanks for having um, me. Yes. Appreciate the time. Yeah. Thank you to Jose back there. Thank you to Icon. Thanks, Icon. 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 Yeah. Jose. See you soon. Bye.